Thank you, uh, Kingsley. Thanks very much. Um, that certainly was uh, informative and insightful and uh, an excellent overview for, for, so thank you for, for that. Um, so look, what, what we're gonna do is we are, we're gonna open up the floor to uh, Q&A. Anyone who'd like to ask a question, just to click on the Q&A tab um, in front of them. And, and we'll, certainly, we'll certainly ask questions of any members of the panel. Um, so look, what I'd like to do is uh, just in the meantime, I'd like to uh, just bring in Gabby and Andy and, um, and just ask a couple of questions about how things have been going for uh, the two guys. So, um, so look, Gabby is uh, an Irish international and a member of the Scorchers team here in Ireland. And uh, you're very welcome. Gabby, and I know uh, today is uh, probably a difficult day for you because uh, you should have been playing Scotland today in, in La Manga. And unfortunately, that series was cancelled for, uh, for COVID reasons just uh, literally 20, 24 hours before it started. So, um, so look, I know that's challenging for, for a lot of people, especially the players. Um, so I suppose, Gabby, how have you, um, over the last uh, year, managed to, I suppose, keep yourself motivated and and how have you been during the the, the pandemic um obviously having a a tour obviously booked in place was obviously a great motivation and something to to train towards and we we're obviously really excited to get get cricket played we haven't played cricket in 14 months so that's a long time to just be training um but yeah we we're obviously so excited for that tour and having that now cancelled it's obviously a bit of a bit of a downer but look You've, there's nothing you can do now and it's, it's not going to change so obviously we've hoped that we'll get a tour early next year or um so we're just trying to keep ourselves motivated obviously like pre-Christmas we're kind of trying to focus on our fitness side of things and um, obviously we've been training for so long so it's hard to to keep going like when you don't really have something to look forward to so we've kind of taken a break from the skills for a bit and we're just focusing on our fitness and fitness and gym stuff at the moment. Okay, uh, thank, thanks, Gabby. Yeah, look, difficult times for, for everyone. And Andy, if I could uh, bring you in. So uh, Andy, obviously, uh, uh, captain of the international team. This has been your first year as captain, an unusual year to be captain. But uh, I suppose uh, a bit more uh, a bit more look on the men's side. You, you have had some cricket. And I think if we look back on the stats book, uh, uh, the stats uh, for, for, for 2020, we'd have seen that we've, uh, we've beaten the T20 world champions, uh, the West Indies in their, in their own backyard. And uh, as Warren mentioned earlier, we've also beaten the ODI world champions, England in the UK in August. So, so successful on the pitch, but how have you found the year for, uh, for yourself and, and the team, Andy? How, how have things been? Um. Yeah, I suppose for me, first and foremost, thank you to Kingsley for that presentation. That was really interesting and, and great to hear a uh, sort of different side of things for, for me particularly. Um, yeah, it's been challenging. It's been challenging for everyone, not just the, the cricketers, um, for the people in, in Cricket Ireland. I think what Warren said about how, how well they've got through this is, is almost like an inspiration for us that, you know, we just go out and play with the people who are behind the scenes getting everything going um, so that we can play as a is a credit to them. Um, I suppose looking back on it, um, whenever you do kind of have those days where you're, you're feeling a bit low or you're feeling a bit sorry for yourself, you've got to kind of realise that, you know, at the start of the year, we were in Barbados, uh, Grenada and St. Kitts. Um, we were in India just before it all sort of kicked off. And in the middle of, you know, a huge pandemic, we got to play the world champions um, in front of a huge audience, albeit at home. Um, so looking back on it, yeah, it has been challenging that we haven't played much cricket, the cricket that we want to have played, but certainly looking back and, and seeing the performances we've had with a relatively new squad, a relatively young squad, an experienced squad, um, I think we can definitely be proud of what we've done this year. Um, and I think the whole organisation can be proud of, of what we've achieved this year. And, and hopefully it's a, things, it's a sign of things to come for the, for the new year. Grant, thanks, Andy. And you've certainly given us some uh, memorable moments and, and highlights this year. So, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's with, with those, especially those two excellent uh, victories. Uh, so, so, Gabby, just um, back to yourself, looking forward to 2021, um, we are going to have uh, a World Cup uh, qualifying campaign. 
uh, towards the end of the year, which we're, we're looking forward to. Uh, so what would you, I suppose, your own hopes and aspirations be for, uh, for you and for the team for the year ahead? Um, yeah, obviously we had been focusing on that because obviously it was meant to be in July of this year. So um, having that for some to, to next year, it's actually really, we've got quite a young squad. So I think that extra year under our belt will do, do us the world of good. Um, we've got some young, young players, Orla, Orla Vernegas coming in and obviously now on a contract, which is brilliant. So it's obviously something to look forward to now and having that in July set in stone um, is really, really exciting for us. And obviously we hope to qualify and that's, that's what we our big aim is. Yeah, thanks, Gabby. And, and look, we do uh, wish you the, the very best of, of luck um, with that. And, and look, a thank you to, a shout out to Hanley en Energy who've been great supporters of women's cricket for the last number of number of years. Um, so Andy, just back to yourself, um, look, a big year for for the men's team as well, a huge year, uh, probably, you know, in terms of activity will certainly be, I think, the busiest year we'll have had so far. There's there's a World Cup, uh, T20 World Cup, Cup coming up in India next November, and there's a number of very important World Cup uh, ODI qualifiers. Uh, so what would be your own hopes um, for uh, the men's team next year? Um, well, first and foremost is I hope we play all the cricket that we're due to play. Um, that's the kind of the main aim for us. Um, I mentioned in an interview a couple of weeks back that our, what I'm really looking forward to is playing in front of a home crowd. Um, you know, we haven't done it in such a long time and we know how good that support can be for us when we're playing those home games. Um, we have that World Cup to look forward to in India, which is obviously a, a really amazing place to play cricket, um, particularly a world event like that. We have a lot of guys who haven't experienced World Cups or, or World T20s, so that will certainly be a, a, an experience that I think could potentially bring the best out of some of our young players. Um, so, yeah, look, we've got a really exciting year to look forward to these World Cup qualifiers and the 50 over stuff you know we got the 10 points in Southampton but it's just important that we kind of build on that and, and make sure that that wasn't just a flash in the pan so there's a lot to look forward to um we but at the same time we've just got to make sure that we take each day as it comes like everything I suppose at the moment and, and make sure that the time that we aren't playing we're doing all the right things to make sure that we put in good performances because I, I suppose talking about networking the best thing for us as players to do for Cricket Ireland is to go out and put in performances and win games and and therefore, people take notice of that and, and people want to get involved in that, hopefully. So um, it's a big year for us and, and hopefully for Cricket Ireland as well. Yeah, look, thank, thanks very much, um, Andy, for, for your thoughts. And, and uh, well done on your first year as captain. It's been difficult, but like I said, there's been some very memorable moments. And, and thanks to, to you and Gabby for joining us. Um, look, we're, 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 we've got a couple of questions uh, coming through, which we're going to share with the panel now um, in, in a moment. And um, so, so look, in terms of Kingsley, your, your own presentation, um, you mentioned too about painting the shop when business is down. I think I think a lot of us have probably become master decorators over the last uh, 10, 10, or, ten or eleven months because we we we've had the time to do do those things. Um, and look, I certainly uh, did find your presentation insightful and, and informative, which uh, we, we were hoping to do. So 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 thank you for that. Um, I suppose a question I'd like to ask you is. Um, on the subject of networking, there's certainly some good takeaways coming from your presentation, but there are, are, are there any things we can do ourselves in terms of research, any good books that you'd recommend or, um, you know, work we can do ourselves to kind of uh, polish up on our own kind of networking skills? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the first thing of all, it's like, it's like uh, realize that the, it is an issue and uh, you know, everybody has to kind of make a decision. Am I, going to, am I going to spend time and energy doing this or not? So that's a very fundamental personal thing. In terms of lockdown, Christmas and everything, books to read, I actually grabbed some off the back here. Um, and I, I know this sounds funny to say this, but this, this is still a legendary book in the space because this was written uh, way, way, way back, but this is in every bookshop in every airport in the world today. And, and this guy, Warren, uh, this guy Dale Carnegie, you know, wrote this book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. You know, sold 30 million copies. It's uh, it's it's extraordinary. And what's kind of interesting about it is that what he says is quite timeless. 
So he said some really simple things. He said, the sweetest sound that anybody ever heard is the sound of their own name. How nice is that? He said, the smile on your face means, is, means more than the clothes on your back. He said, to be interesting, be interested. He said, you know, a really good question beats a really good comment. He said that when you talk about yourself and what you've achieved in life, people think you're a bore. But when you let somebody else talk about themselves and what they've achieved in life, they think you're a great conversationalist. So he said lots of slightly folksy kind of things, but they, they really stood the test of time. A more recent book that I, I read, uh, I think is, is worth a read is, um, this is called The Startup of You by Reid Hoffman. Reid Hoffman sat, startup, set up a company called LinkedIn that we mentioned earlier. So he knows a thing or two about networking. Um, and he talks a lot about network intelligence and how you use your connections and contacts to build intelligence about the environment, the economy, the world in which you live. And so I think that's a good read too. Um, I didn't really get a, a chance to, to dig into some of the skill sides of networking. And in particular, I think being a, a really great listener is the number one skill in networking. And we live in a world where most people don't listen. Most people think that listening is a sign of weakness. Most people think that you know, speaking is a sign of strength, control, and power. Uh, most people are either speaking or preparing to speak. Um, most people are trying to wow us. Most people are narcissistic listeners. So Dennis, if I say to you, you know, I'm thinking of buying a motor car, and you say, I bought one last weekend. The guy wanted 20,000. I got, got it for 10,000. So I couldn't give a shit about you and your car, but you've taken my story. You've hijacked it. And people do that all the time. So it's just the world we live in. So being aware of that is very important. So this woman, a woman called Nancy Klein, has written a book called Time to Think, which I think is a really great. And one of the things she says about meetings, she said, nobody has arrived at a meeting until they've spoken, which is a lovely thought. But uh, everybody has to speak at a meeting before the whole meeting can really get going. Um, so I think there are three good ones. This one, uh, this is a guy who's been at the Pendulum Summit a few times. Yeah, Keith Ferrazzi, Never Read Alone. He, that's a very popular, it's a big seller. It's a New York Times bestseller book. So that's another one. So there's lots of stuff out there. Um, but like, uh, as I said at the beginning, it's just to recognize that this is an issue and then take some action. Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um... Uh, Kingsley, look, a uh, question, Warren, that, that's come true for yourself is just, um, it's around, uh, Kingsley mentioned uh, the importance of India and uh, I suppose the uh, common denominator that cricket is for, uh, provides between Ireland and, and England. Um, so the question here is, um, how would you see the this opportunity in terms of uh, positioning cricket with government? Uh, you know, is there an opportunity for us to uh, strengthen links between both countries with cricket as a platform? Thanks, Dennis. In fact, it looks like I've asked myself a question there, doesn't it? I think it's just because uh, Kingsley's name is uh, Kingsley's screen has come up with my name on it. But um, yeah, I promise right. you it's not me asking myself a question to hear my own voice, just to address the concern that Kingsley had a little bit earlier. Um, Kingsley, look, thank you very much for the question and um, sort of echo what Dennis said. I've, I've had the pleasure and privilege of listening to you on a number of occasions now, and I, I, I've always found it fascinating. You always manage to ground um, what seems difficult or sounds difficult into very human and, and people-related terms, so it's always fascinating to hear about that. To answer your question, um, we had the good fortune of inviting um, the former Taoiseach and soon to be next Taoiseach, Leo Varadkar, when he was um, he literally, Fianna Gael had just come into office mm -hmm. in 2011. And it was the time of the Cricket World Cup in India. And um, having really struggled to engage with any minister um, uh, hitherto, it's cricket, and oh, well, we're not really interested in hearing about that, are we? In spite of our, our number of efforts to engage with the Irish Indian Business Association, Enterprise Ireland, the Department of Foreign Affairs, um, hitherto, we really didn't have much success. Um, we then had a full day at Ireland versus the Netherlands in Kolkata. It was about um, at about 110 degrees. It was absolutely frying, and we had Minister Leo Varadkar fresh in as the Tourism, Transport and Sport Minister, and he was thoroughly engaged. He saw Ireland beat the Netherlands, and soon on the heels of that, he went home, he wrote a, a story for the Irish Times in which he said that um, Ireland's performances in the World Cup, particularly the fact that we'd beaten England, didn't just raise Irish cricket's profile in India, it raised the entire nation 
of Ireland's profile in India. And it probably gave Irish cricket op an opportunity to engage with him then subsequently throughout his career when he became Minister of Health, Social Protection, and then eventually Taoiseach. We hosted Ireland versus India for two T20Is in Malahide. The sun shone gloriously. We had 10,000 people turn up to two games of cricket twice within the space of, of um, 48, 72 hours. Um, extraordinary. And, um, and the Taoiseach was, uh, was engaged enough to take our texts to say, are you happy to turn up to our game? He said, yep, just on the way back from Brussels from a um, from an EU summit will come straight from the airport and um, alas he turned up just as the time as we were um, <laughs> as the game had finished um, alas early um, not quite right for the right um, result reason but he stayed around he handed the heads of the world cricket who were there um, because we were also hosting ICC's global AGM that particular day and it was gold dust we had all of the heads of the world game we had full hospitality. We had the Indian cricket team that he and his father, who is Indian, Ashok Varadka, went into their dressing room. It was gold dust. And um, uh, Sunil, Sunil Gavaskar, who is um, Leo's father's um, um, great hero, was also there commentating. He came around and said hello, picture taken with the family. These sorts of things are, are just, as you said, are gold dust. And when, of course, we follow that up with talking about the numbers in which we can engage um, in government, the population that we can reach in key economic and tourism marketplaces, I think it's fair to say that um, those numbers are now beginning to be listened to by the government. I just want to come back on one thing as well. You said a little bit earlier on, um, Kingsley, you may not know this, but uh, Indra Nooyi, is ICC, the International Cricket Council's sole independent director. So um, when you said that she was also the um, former head of the island US um, uh, diaspora organization, um, that has now been double asterisked in my, um, in my notes from your presentation. And interestingly enough, she was also taught by um, Franciscan, um, Franciscan brothers. So there you go. When she was um, when she was growing up in India, Irish sorry Irish brothers. When she was growing up in India, yeah. If you go into the Irish Embassy in Delhi, there's this wonderful painting in the hallway of St Patrick's College in uh, Delhi, which was the elite, the Eton, if you like. If it sounds contradictory, but of India, some of the great leaders of India were actually taught by Irish priests uh, going back. So there's always been that historical connection and historical connections through the British Army as well, of Irish people. Um, so, um, so yeah, I just think uh, my sense is that, you know, cricket could be a catalyst, could be a, could be a bit of a sort of a, 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 a way of bringing the countries together. The, the interest is phenomenal. And, um, you know, some of our, you know, some of our players are better known in India than they are in Ireland. Indeed, and in fact, um, Kevin O'Brien, I'm sure all of our all of our audience would know. You know, certainly one of our our foremost players after that World Cup in India, the Department for Education asked him to do some adverts in India and South Asia to try and get overseas students to come and study in Ireland. So there's there's already evidence, I guess, of the way that cricket is recognised in Irish government circles as a way to penetrate that marketplace in a way that certainly no other sport can. As I think I've said on a number of my um, my speeches in the past, um, the likes of Bono, Bob Geldof, Brian O'Driscoll, completely unknown in um, in India, but um, Andy Balburnie, Kevin O'Brien, William Porterfield. Um, they would yeah. struggle to walk down the streets um, <laughs> un unpushed around. Wonderful, wonderful, yeah. great story. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for, for, for that, Warren. And, and I suppose that the same, same certainly applies to a number of our sponsors who have relationships with India, uh, be it some of them who are based there, some who are working within the marketplace trying to break into it, and some who work with suppliers there. So, so certainly cricket offers those valued partners a platform as well. Um, so just some uh, some uh, questions coming in here. Um, I see Eddie Evans from Beecham's is, uh, is in the room today. You're very welcome. 
Eddie, there's a question and there's more, I think the second one is more a comment uh, where you're uh, saying, you're asking how come St. Andrew's School in Dublin, this is for and Andy and Gabby, produces so many great cricketers. Uh, I suspect that you're possibly an ex-pupil yourself, uh, Eddie, but I think that's more, more a comment, uh, acknowledging the success of the school. Um, but the question that Eddie has for Kingsley is, I uh, suppose if you could pick one piece of advice, Kingsley, on networking, the single biggest tip you have, what would that be? So I talked a little bit earlier, so I won't repeat it again, Eddie, about uh, the power of listening and, you know, people, and I, I didn't, I didn't realize this until later in life. I wasn't a great listener, but I realized that listening is very powerful. So I've talked about that. So I'll give you a second one that I think is really interesting. And I call it funnels of serendipity, basically how random chance is going to change your life. How one introduction, one conversation are going to change your life. But, so this notion, some people think that random chance and serendipity is like a bolt of lightning from the blue or, you know, winning the lottery, totally chance. I tend to think it's more like a gentle wind that's always at your back and that you can take advantage of it. Planning will get you, as they say, the tip of the iceberg, but serendipity, chance and luck will get you the seven eighths that's underwater. So I think you have to kind of reimagine and rethink your life so you increase the possibility of chance happening. So put it this way, chance doesn't happen lying in bed and doesn't happen sitting at your desk. You know, as somebody said, if you think about the most exciting things in your life, looking back, did they happen in front of a screen or did they happen with other people? Well, most people would say with other people. So I love that notion of serendipity and chance that you can actually make luck happen for you by changing your routines, by talking to strangers, by you know, putting your talents on display, by building an online profile, you know, by doing all these active things, you can increase the possibility of chance happening. So that would be my favorite one. Uh, thank you, um, Kingsley. And look, I'm just conscious of time here. So um, just a couple, uh, two more questions that have come in for you, Kingsley, and, and we may wrap it up there at that point, and I'll just close uh, then. Uh, is there, can you give an example your, yourself um, to the audience how sport has helped you, specifically sport has helped you with your network? <laughs> well, that's funny. You know, I'll, get, I'll tell you a quick story to finish off the morning, if you like. I, when I got posted to Australia, I didn't know anybody. Uh, but my mother had a, a neighbor whose son was in Sydney, so I rang him and I asked him, could we meet for coffee? And he said, sure, let's meet for coffee. And I asked him, could you introduce me to the local Irish business club? And he said, there isn't one. And I said, well, why don't we set one up? And he said, okay. So we realized that the CEO of the Australian Rugby Union was a guy called John O'Neill. So I connected with John and he said, I'll host your dinner. So we had 30 people for dinner. It was fantastic, really great. We discovered all these new people. So last year I was invited back uh, no, we call it the Lansdowne Road Club because we both played rugby. And then in a spirit of sporting ecumenism, we decided to dr drop the word road and just call it the Lansdowne Club. So last year I got invited back to their 30th anniversary of that first little dinner. And there was 2000 people at the lunch. It was the biggest Irish business network in the world. Nobody started a larger organization. This started from zero. When Ireland play Australian rugby, they play for the Lansdowne Cup. And so... To me, that was, that was my, my great sort of breakthrough. It was fantastic to see this happen. But to, it increases because I, I was trying to find somebody who would, be, who would be the head of this organization, who would be a well-known name in Irish business, and, and he'd lend his name. He didn't have to do anything, but lend his name to this organization. So I wrote to the guy I mentioned earlier. I wrote to Tony O'Reilly, H.J. Hines Food Company in Pittsburgh. I was a total nobody, and he was a big CEO. And I was amazed. I got a reply from him. I got an answer back to the letter and he said three things. He said, I'm, I'm really interested in building networks of Irish people around the world with the Ireland funds. Secondly, he said, I'm buying newspapers in Australia. And thirdly, he said, I'm going to be in Australia in about six weeks. And could we meet for lunch? So I was going to write back and say, nah, I'm busy. But I know I said, I'd love to meet you for lunch. I met him for lunch. I brought along two photographs from the 1955 Lions tour of South Africa when in the first test they won 23-22 with a try in the last minute and that uh, uh, this wonderful photograph of Jack van der Schaaf missing the conversion in the last second the South African fullback so we talked about rugby for about an hour I ended up working for him for 21 years 
So random chance, serendipity, luck, all these things that you can certainly make them happen for you. And it certainly, and I moved then to Boston and uh, it certainly had an enormous impact, but it was fairly random, the whole thing, just the starting the thing. And, you know, you can't plan these things, but but if you go into these things with an open mind and, and uh, just open for whatever happens, you'd be pleasantly surprised sometimes. Thanks, Kingsley. And, and look, sport certainly is a is a is a great connector, and we can see it in in that case there for, for you. And um, so, look, really, just one I suppose final question that's come in here as well. Uh, you've talked a lot about the Irish uh, diaspora, um, and we're going to be circulating information um, after the event as well on 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 groups Irish groups around the world uh, with contact details. But how? Um, you know, are there ways we can find it from your own perspective, find out more information about these groups? Um, any advice you'd have there? So I think Ireland possesses what I call diaspora capital, uh, which is um, the resources available to a, a country, location, city, organization. It's made up of three flows, flows of people, flows of money, flows of knowledge. I think what's, and why I mentioned India today, I think Ireland and India and Israel are the three leaders in the world. I did a, I did a conference call yesterday with uh, 15 different countries, uh, all their ministries of foreign affairs. And all they want to learn about is what has Ireland done? What's India done? What's Israel done? Back to the case theory. It's a non-competitive industry. We should learn from each other. And I think, um, and I think what, what, what those lists you've got, um, they cover lots of different areas because what Ireland's done, we, we've, got, we've got incredible organizations in sports. I mean, the GAA worldwide have about 600 clubs. We have 6,000 Irish pubs around the world that, of course, they serve li liquor, but they f serve as kind of social locations. We've got 500 Kyoltas Kyoltori branches around the world. That's for traditional Irish music. You know, we've got all these business groups, cultural groups, dancing groups. The dancing, Irish dancing is an extraordinary phenomenon around the world. So this is our soft power. This is what we have. Um, and sport fits really neatly into all of that. So I think the, the information that you're going to be distributed, and it's a terrific piece of work that the Department of Foreign Affairs did, they've actually listed all these organizations. Some of these organizations look after pensioners, some of them look after ex-prisoners, some of them look after people with mental health. When I was working in with the Ireland Funds, I was very close to a guy called Peter Sutherland, who was the head of Goldman Sachs and BP. And we launched a thing called the Forgotten Irish in the UK, which is to raise some millions for Irish people who had emigrated in the 50s and 60s and after the Second World War, the reconstruction of Britain. And they were at a stage where they were beginning to have some difficulties, etc. And, and part of diaspora strategy, and the government are good at this, I think, is to not only identify the what we call the A&I, the affluent and influential around the world, but also to look out for the vulnerable. So it's about having a policy that finds the successful and connects with them, but also identifies and works with the vulnerable. And so Ireland's got been a real exemplar in this space. And so many other countries in the world, around the world, they just want to copy and learn from what Ireland's done. And in the, Ireland's latest diaspora strategy, which was published last week, there is a, there's part of that is, um, is positioning Ireland as a world leader in diaspora engagement for other countries to learn from us, but also working with the new Irish in Ireland who might be from Lithuania, might be from Nigeria, and helping them do the sort of things that we did years ago with our groups around the world. So I think there's a, a pretty interesting kind of mix of things going on there. Brilliant. Well, look, thank you very much, um, Kingsley. And we're, we're, we're just at uh, eleven thirty now, so I think it's uh, what I'd like to do now is suppose bring the session to uh, to a close. Um, no, I, I think it's been an excellent um, presentation, Kingsley, and, and it's been very, very informative. And I hope we can all take something from today, uh, including, you know, how how we can go, we can go about growing our networks more and using the Cricket Ireland uh, corporate network, which we're all part of. Uh, so whether it's growing your contacts, identifying synergies, new leads, uh, we want everyone on, on the call here to be able to use Cricket Ireland network uh in a, in a in a tangible way um so look we're, we're i mean in cricket ireland uh we view the relationship we have with our partners it's 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 much more than simply writing checks delivering entitlements um so we'd invite all of our partners and the attendees to view this network as a diverse 
uh, national and global network that can support your business. Uh, and we really want you to, to tap into us and, and to utilize the network. Uh, so look, as a follow on from today, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be sharing uh, overviews of all our partners, uh, along with um, their contact details. Uh, we're gonna be sharing that with all the attendees and then details of Irish agencies and communities abroad, which Kingsley uh, talked about. We'll also be sharing Kingsley's networking tips as well. Um, and that we're, we're available ourselves, Cricket Ireland, to make introductions uh, between our partners uh, amongst each other. We can do that directly, um, our two or broader network. So, so I wouldn't hesitate to get in touch with uh, myself or Eva just to let us know um, if there are any introductions we, we can help you with. Um, so that's really uh, all, all from today. And I'd like to close by thanking uh, the members of, of our panel uh, for being here to uh, Kingsley, uh, Warren, uh, Gabby and Andrew, and uh, to thank our audience as well um, for, for joining us um, and to thank ITW who manage the technology and the Zoom call today. Um, the, there was a slight hiccup with names being presented. I think I've been presented as Kingsley and, and Kingsley as Warren. So look, it's, it's, it, these things happen uh, with Zoom, I suppose. Um, but anyway, thank you to everyone for being here, uh, for being part of the conference. And we'd like to wish uh, all our partners, your staff and your families uh, the very best of luck. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Dennis. Well Take done. Take care, everybody. Take care. See ya. Bye bye. Take care.